Cheers and salutations. Welcome one and all to Americans Learn. And today, well, this one's going to be a very interesting video to check out. So, look, um, might as well rip the Band-Aid off. Dr. Hans Munich. The good man of Auschwitz. So, um... This is from Biographics. Uh, I think it's, this is going to be a very difficult video to sit through in regards towards, well, the good doctor and who he was associated with, uh, especially when we look at um, the many, 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 many crimes of the Third Reich. So uh, let's... Get ready to get our learn on for Americans Learn. And uh, get ready to check this video out since I'm in charge of the ones and twos. And as always, uh, please support the original content creator. The original link is in the description box below. Let's get ready to play this video in a three, a two, a one. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month and 30 days for free if you sign up through the link below and use the code BIOGRAPHICS. More about them in a bit. This is the nightmare I live with. This is how today's protagonist describes the haunting memories of his experience at the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp 50 years after the events of World War II. But this man was a doctor, not a gaunt prisoner or harrowed survivor. He was, in fact, an SS medical officer, one of the many Nazi doctors who worked within the industry of death that the concentration camp served as the backbone of. But unlike many of his more infamous peers, this man went down in history as a good doctor. A good man. The SS and a good man. Two words that you wouldn't think would uh, be put together properly or should be anywhere near each other. Let's find out where we're going with this. Who did his best to save human lives or at minimum to preserve a sliver of dignity for the camp's prisoners. His name was Hans Wilhelm Munch, also known Munch. as the good okay. man of Auschwitz. I call them Munich. I apologize, Munch. My apologies. A reluctant party member. Okay, let's... Hans Munch was born on May the 14th, 1911 in Freiburg im Breisgau, Baden, then part of the Second German Reich. His parents were Ernst and Matilda Niesan. Hans inherited from Ernst an interest in science, and after graduating from high school, he took up medicine, studying at universities of Munich and Tübingen. In 1933, Hitler and the Nazi Party were in power and gradually exerting influence over every aspect of life. As Hans progressed in his medical studies, he considered gaining formal party membership as a prerequisite to have and keep any future job. In later interviews, Hans Munch stated that he tolerated Nazi ideology but never actively supported it. He was some Somewhat enthused by the patriotic rhetoric, and he recognized that the German economy and welfare of the middle class had improved since the Nazis took power. His family was even less enthusiastic about National Socialism. His father, Ernst, was completely indifferent, while Mum Matilda was strongly opposed. As per the anti-Semitic stance of the party, well, the entire family detested it wholeheartedly. But to Hans's own admission, they never took it seriously. To the future Dr. Munch, the anti-Semitic propaganda was little more than empty words and bombast. He could never believe that the Nazis would actually take violent, systematic actions against German Jews. For these reasons, in 1934, Hans joined, without much conviction, two Nazi youth organizations, the National Socialist Mechanized Corps and the National Socialist Union of Students. It wasn't until May of 1937 that Hans became a card-carrying member of the Nazi Party, and even then, it happened almost by chance. As Hans completed his studies, he entered a scientific competition to find a local alternative to agar agar, an imported substance derived from red algae. At the time, it was used in labs as a culture medium to study bacteria. Hans won the competition. His entry into the contest, a few lines describing the new substance, was 
accept it as a dissertation thesis. Moreover, he received further praise and recognition from the party itself. While completing his medical internship, he was given a leadership position in a bacteriological department, supervising scientific teams producing the new culture medium. In so it was all just a series of uh, coincidences and everything working out, uh, I guess, in a way to make it seem like he would be part of the party, even though he, I guess, was reluctant about it. Um, you know, I mean, there are incidences of people who were living in Germany at the time who probably were unaware of just how far Adolf Hitler would lead uh, Germany down the dark abyss that would be the Second World War. And, you know, when we look at the Depression and how worldwide millions upon millions upon millions of people were impacted by it, um, there was a time of absolute desperation and people starving and dying in the streets. And when we look at the videos, you know, we, we can look at it through the comfort of our cell phones or computers and you know, it, it's one thing to watch. It's another thing altogether to live through it. And with the aftermath of the First World War and then eventually the Depression, um, there was an era or an environment of desperation in which people clinged to a system or what would eventually be a uh, political institution that promised them that they would uplift them out of poverty. And out of that desperation, a heavy price was put upon them. Oh, I, let, let, let this let this serve as a lesson. Always, always read a contract. And just because someone says they'll make their life easier for you, just just really ask yourself what's in it for them. But all right, let's find out more about the good doctor. Exchange, though, he had to join the Nazi party. As Munch later declared, he had run out of reasons not to join. Ah. Reluctant party member to now eager volunteer. Okay. On September the 1st, 1939, the long dark night of Europe began as German troops crossed the border into Poland. Many doctors had been drafted into the armed forces. But as Hans became Dr. Munch, he was labeled indispensable. He was not drafted, and military authorities asked him to stay in Germany to replace other physicians who had been sent to the front. During the early months of World War II, Dr. Munch was in a small countryside hospital in Bavaria, acting as a replacement for an absent medical medical officer. While stationed there, he met and married his wife, also a fellow doctor. Against her wishes in early 1941, Hans volunteered to join the armed forces. His motivation lay in patriotism, as well as feelings of guilt. He, a young man, had a comfortable position in a countryside hospital while older doctors were dying on the front line. Hans was still indispensable, though, and his application was rejected. He then tried to seek help from his sister, a secretary at the office of the general staff. She arranged a series of meetings with various officers and ministry officials, but with little result. Dr. Munch remained stuck in Bavaria until one day in Munich he ran into an old school friend, Dr. Strasberger. Strasberger told Hans that he was doing well, as he had secured a non-specified job with the government. When Munch told him about his difficulty in joining the military, the old friend advised that he volunteer for the Waffen-SS rather than the regular army. Strasberger was an SS officer himself and was actually part of the staff of Reinhard Heydrich, the SS second-in-command. Munch was delighted about the encounter. The Waffen-SS were the fighting unit of the organization. Joining them would mean helping fellow troops at the front. In other words, he could fulfill his duty as a patriotic German. At that time, he did not suspect, or at least he claimed he did not suspect, that the Waffen-SS could be also involved in the administration of the concentration camps. More After seeing all the propaganda, you know, all the leaflets, you know, good Dr. Hans, you, you, you really want to play like, oh, I didn't think they'd really do it, but okay, fine. Look, I mean, ev everything that the Third Reich or what, what eventually would be, you know, the Nazi government, uh, you know, if, if 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 you really listen to what they were saying, uh, of of course there was going to be follow through, and I guess okay, I guess the doctor still wants to be blind blindly ignorant. Okay, that's a statement. 
so be it. Moreover, Munch had little knowledge of the camps, or again, so he claimed. He admitted that he knew about Dachau and other camps in northern Germany, but he was allegedly unaware of the extent of the atrocities being perpetrated. When his application was accepted, Munch was told that he would initially be posted near Krakow in Poland. After completing his SS officer training in June of 1943, the Nazis kept their promise. Dr. Hans Munch was posted to the Hygiene Institute of the Waffen-SS in Rysko near Krakow. Krakow. This institute performed all hygienic and bacteriological laboratory work for the local SS, Wehrmacht, and police units. Its lab analyzed samples of blood and other fluids to detect cases of typhus, malaria, and syphilis. It also managed growth cultures for a variety of bacteria in order to develop antibiotic treatments and vaccines. Because of his experience with bacterial cultures, this was a logical assignment for Dr. Munch. He later realized that the Hygiene Institute was assigned regular shipments of beef to be used in the bacterial culture. The meat, however, was often seized by SS officers for culinary purposes. The lab technicians had to make do with other materials to replace the confiscated beef. Typically, it was human flesh coming from the corpses of prisoners, resistance fighters, dissidents, homosexuals, religious minorities, Roma, Sinti, Jews. In other words, undesirables, whose dead bodies could be provided in industrial quantities by a structure located some four kilometers from Brysko in a place called Oswiesem, and this is better known by its German name, Auschwitz. The Reisko Laboratory was one of many satellite facilities of the larger Auschwitz-Birkenau complex, which were dedicated to medical, chemical, and pharmacological work. The Hygiene Institute's main task was to control outbreaks of infectious diseases at the camp, as well as to trial new medicines. Other facilities and medical teams were purposefully dedicated to dangerous, unethical experimentation on human subjects. The most infamous case is that of the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph Mengele, whose biography we've already covered on this channel. <sighs> okay, well, um, okay, uh, I, again, I'm unfamiliar with Dr. Hans Munch. I'm, I'm very curious to see why he is called the good man, but already, uh, he, he comes off to me, this is my interpretation, as someone who is blindly ignorant or just choosing to ignore the screams and hoping that they'll go away. I get it. The depression made everyone desperate, but after a while, coming out of that desperation wasn't worth it. And, okay, these are his statements. He didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't think things would happen, but uh, there has to come a point where it's just, okay, did, did you purposely just ignore the dead bodies that you were stepping over, or did you just kind of knew but pretended that they'd go away? I mean... I, I guess I don't know. I, I can only can imagine what kind of mental gymnastics was going on in his head and until he got to Auschwitz, I guess. Engler was particularly notorious for his trials on identical twins, the so-called perfect specimens. One could serve as a control subject while the other endured the experiments. Such was the environment that welcomed Dr. Munch, a decent man with little interest in Nazi ideology and with no ambitions of advancing his own career at the expense of unwilling test subjects. Munch later stated that after visiting the main camp for the first time with his wife, both were shocked. His wife refused to take lodgings in Reisko and returned to Germany. Could Hans have done the same? In a later interview, he claimed that SS officers and soldiers did not have a choice to leave Auschwitz once they had been assigned to it. This was disputed by the interviewer, Dagmar Ostermann. As an Auschwitz prisoner, she was forcibly drafted as clerical helper into an administrative office within the camp. There, she processed several requests of SS personnel who would rather go to the front than serve at Auschwitz. So, if he had the chance to leave, why did he stay? Dr. Munch claims that after his initial months at the Institute, co-workers and prisoners themselves asked him not to leave as he was needed there. So why did they need him? Because very early on, Dr. Munch behaved like one of the only real human beings on the German side of the camp, like a real doctor, more loyal to the Hippocratic Oath than to the Third Reich. 
The hygienic institute was staffed by some hundred prisoners, mostly Jewish and Polish, with previous experience in medicine and lab research. They worked at Rysko essentially as skilled slave labor, under Munch's direct supervision. As they joined the institute, these workers would be marched in and mistreated by SS guards. Munch was the only one who took time to meet each one in person, shaking their hands and welcoming them to the institute. The simple act of civility put him under the spotlight of his superiors. Someone nudged me that my behavior was unacceptable. One prisoner, Dr. Louis Michels, also worked with him daily and described Munch as friendly. He showed personal interest in people, never humiliated anyone. He seemed oddly out of place. Now, just before we continue... Um... Uh, we've all seen the stories. We've all seen movies and TV shows that show the horrors of Auschwitz and... Um, the fact that there was only one person there that showed an ounce of humanity, I just have the amount of depravity, the, the abuse, the nightmare to, to go through with something like that, to treat another human being like that is unimaginable. Um, people telling him not to go. He was the only good doctor there. Perhaps his conscience really got the better of him. With today's video, I do want to take a moment to thank who's made it possible, and that's Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Now, if you're enjoying this one, then why not try out Curiosity Stream for free and check out their docu series called Apocalypse World War II? If you want to get a bigger picture on what's going on in today's video, that's a great documentary to check out. Curiosity Stream is available on pretty much every platform you can imagine Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS. The list really does go on. Look, if you've got a stream that was made in the last 10 years, you're probably going to be able to watch Curiosity Stream on it. It's also available worldwide no geo restrictions get unlimited access starting at just 2.99 a month and for you guys the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash biographics and use the promo code biographics during the sign up process it's a great way to support the show and let's get back to it Looking after the staff at Rysko was one of the reasons for Munch to stay. The other was related to the infamous Block 10. This was a ward where the chief medical officer at Auschwitz, Dr. Eduard Wirths, studied new diagnostic methods for cervical cancer. Useful research, but carried out on subjects without their informed consent. Since April 1, 1943, Block 10 was also the theater of sterilization experiments. Here, Dr. Karl Klauberg sought a method for sterilizing unsuspecting women. He devised a technique of injecting a caustic substance into a patient's uterus over the course of what she thought was an ordinary gynecological examination. A camp survivor described these experiments. A white substance was then injected into my uterus. The syringe was about 30 centimeters long. Such injections were done to me three times with breaks of three or four months. After each injection, I had a terrible burning sensation in my abdomen. Dr. Klarberg was assisted by a nurse, Sylvia F., a Jewish prisoner from Slovakia. Dr. Munch, who worked occasionally in Block 10, described her as being about 20 years old, tall, and very beautiful. More importantly, she was Klarberg's right hand and demanded absolute respect as she selected which women would be sent to the gas chambers at Birkenau. When Klarberg was moved to another post, some 25 young women were still in Block 10. Their function was now to provide saliva samples to the Hygiene Institute in Rysko. But eventually, Munch's superiors asked him to terminate the collection of saliva. As innocuous as it sounded, the cessation of saliva samples was a death sentence for those women. Now that they were not involved in experiments any longer, they were going to be gassed. Dr. Munch could not accept that. During a sleepless night, he devised a plan. He concocted a new experiment, requiring these women as participants, a clinical trial to assess the efficacy of a new vaccine against granuloma, an infection of the gums. The project was approved, and he was able to save the young women of Block 10. He warns them, you must tell everyone that these experiments are very painful and disagreeable so that the headquarters people do not get wind of anything. This was one of many instances in which Dr. Munch designed new harmless trials or extended pre-existing experiments to ensure test subjects were not marched to the 
infamous showers at the camp. He found ways to help prisoners more directly as well. An official court document later stated he was helpful in the frame of his possibilities and even risking his own safety. For example, Dr. Munch helped women prisoners meet their husbands in secret. He succeeded in exempting at least two inmates from the punishment battalion, and he ensured the transfer away from Rysko of an SS guard against whom the prisoners had complained. Prisoner and colleague Dr. Michals became very ill with appendicitis in the summer of 1944. Munch visited him frequently as he was convalescing, ensuring that Michals had a full recovery. After five weeks, Dr. Michals returned to the institute, but he was very weak due to a lack of food. On his first day back, Munch approached him and, with great secrecy, pulled something out of his pocket. It was an item he had smuggled to help Michals with his recovery a nice sausage. Munch ordered Michals to eat and have some rest, intervening when. Uh, the e e even the, the the cat and mouse game of of trying to even protect people's lives. Okay. Okay. He. Sometimes uh, I I don't even know what to say. Um, I had no idea of this man's story or the lives that he was trying to save and just oh my just looking at the rest of the staff there he he must have been horribly disgusted with the people running the camp when an ss guard grumbled that the prisoner was not on duty later that summer in 1944 dr munch was required to expand his normal duties auschwitz had just received a great influx of jewish prisoners from hungary it was then that all medical personnel on the site were drafted to take part in the infamous selection process colloquially known as ramp duty. This is when doctors examined prisoners as they stepped off transport trains and decided who would work, who would be used in experiments, and who would be sent directly to the gas chambers. The chief medical officer at Auschwitz, Edward Wirth, insisted that all doctors participated in ramp duty, but Dr. Munch would not participate in this arbitrary selection, a thinly disguised power trip presiding over the life and death of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Dr. Wirth may have had authority over doctors at Auschwitz, but Munch formally reported to Paul Reichel, the head of all hygienic institutes headquartered in Berlin. Munch contacted him and told him, I cannot do it, I will not do it, regardless of the consequences. His boss understood. After pulling some strings with the camp commander, he had Munch exempted from the selection process. More importantly, there were no direct consequences, proving again that inside of Auschwitz, an SS officer was the only person who was ever treated with any shred of respect or humanity. In January of 1945, SS authorities began the evacuation of Auschwitz as the Red Army pressed closer from the east. All the Jewish prisoners working at Reisko received the news that they would be transferred to an unknown destination. The lab workers were reluctant, suspecting that they were going to be sent on a death march. Headed by Dr. Michels, they decided to talk to Munch. He shared their concerns and even suggested helping them in a daring escape attempt. He would procure SS uniforms and walk them through the gates of Auschwitz to freedom. Eventually, they agreed it was safer to join the transport column than escape toward the Swiss Alps. Dr. Michels survived the late stages of the war and wrote about his last goodbye with Dr. Munch. To prove his goodwill, he gave us a revolver and ammunition in case we had to shoot our way out. He shook hands with each of us and wished us early freedom. That was the last I saw of him. Dr. Munch was also evacuated. He spent two months in Dachau and then returned home to Bavaria, but he wasn't able to hide the fact that he had been a doctor at Auschwitz. Hans was eventually arrested by the Allied occupation authorities and interned in an American POW camp. From there, he was transferred to Krakow in 1946. He was to sit on the bench of the accused at the first Auschwitz trial. From November the 24th to December the 22nd, 1947, 42 former staff from the concentration camp were put on trial. 23 of the defendants were sentenced to death. 21 of them were hanged on January the 28th, 1948. Two had their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. 18 defendants were found guilty and sentenced to various terms in prison. Only one out of all of them was acquitted and released. Dr. Hans Munch, the righteous doctor, the good man of Auschwitz. During the trial, the main charge against him was that he had injected prisoners with malaria-infected blood. It was alleged that he had caused dramatic fever by injecting an unknown agent into his human guinea pigs. 
but many former prisoners came out in support of Munch. Dr. Louis Michals and other surviving Jews sent their testimonies to Munch's former boss, Paul Reichel. The Krakow court acknowledged how Munch had refused to carry out the selection process and how he had helped prisoners with bogus experiments. It emerged that he had never inoculated malaria and that his injections were intended to treat rheumatism rather than cause it. On the 22nd of December, the court acquitted him with the following motivation. Not only because he did not commit any crime of harm against the camp prisoners, but because he had a benevolent attitude toward them and helped them. He did this independently from the nationality, race, and religious origin and political conviction of the prisoners. After the trial, you know, ah, uh hearing of this man and his and what he had to go through to try and save lives as as best as he could um and, uh, and again it's 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 a little uncomfortable to, to 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 talk about this because you know i guess we're we're so bombarded with i guess short summaries of historic events you know a lot of characters and significant details, important details, are usually passed over or fly under our radars and are easily dismissed. There are so many instances throughout history, just not only in the Second World War, but throughout history of people who have done monumental things to save others. Um, now, again, I, I do find it awkward to say putting the words good man of, and of Auschwitz together in the same sentence, but I think it's fair enough to say that the good doctor, even though he was either choosing to be ignorant, knew just how terrible the Nazis were, or just was just really truly blind uh, and just didn't want to even acknowledge it at all or just was turning a blind eye to it, you know, at the end of the day, you're still a human and you have to make choices. And Dr. Hans never gave up his oath to be a doctor and do no harm. How you could pull that off during that time under that kind of political system, it's, it's a miracle that he was able to keep his humanity intact. And the fact that there were witnesses who came forward to say that this man saved their lives, it really says a lot. Well, Munch returned to Germany and began working as a practicing doctor in Ralshaupten, Bavaria. For many years, neither Munch nor his wife spoke to their children about his experience at Auschwitz. All they knew was that he had been on trial, but that he had been acquitted. His son, Dirk, later said, I think my father was somewhat paralyzed. He could not talk very much to his children about what he saw and felt. In the decades after the end of the war, Dr. Munch became a sought-after witness and expert. His opinion was consulted by prosecutors, journalists, and wow. survivors to shed light on the atrocities perpetrated at Auschwitz. For example, in 1955, Dr. Karl Klauberg, the torturer of Block 10, returned to West Germany. Right after the war, he had been arrested by the Soviets and kept in captivity for a decade. Upon his return, he made several public statements about the medical importance of his work at Auschwitz. Survivors of Block 10 and their families immediately petitioned for Klauberg to be tried. In June of 1946, Dr. Munch was then approached by prosecutors, and he volunteered his testimony, providing valuable details about the activities of Klauberg and his right-hand woman, Nurse Lisa Reff. Some years later, Munch was summoned to the second Auschwitz trial, this time as a key witness. The second trial was held in Frankfurt from December 10, 1963 to August 10, 1965. Twenty-two former SS officers and guards were indicted for their complicity in war crimes. Thanks to Munch's testimony, 18 were found guilty and sentenced to various terms of imprisonment. During the early 1980s, Dr. Munch participated in two documentary films produced for German TV. The director of one of them, Bernard Frankfurter, later arranged for the doctor to meet with a camp survivor, Dag Dagmar Osterman, whom we already quoted. Dagmar interviewed Hans at length in April of 1988. The transcript was later published in a book titled The Meeting, An Auschwitz Survivor Confronts an SS Physician. The interview sheds light on how and why Munch eventually joined the Nazi Party and the SS. It also reveals many details on how exactly he helped prisoners at the camp. However, the editors of the book, Frankfurter and Susan Cerniak-Spatz, also a camp survivor, 
offer a different interpretation. They posit that Munch knew very well what was going on at Auschwitz long before working there, and that he stayed at his post in Reisgau out of opportunism and careerism, mitigated by sporadic acts of kindness. In August of 1993, Hans Munch was interviewed by another Auschwitz survivor, Eva moses Kor. Eva and her twin sister, Miriam, had arrived at the camp in the spring of 1944, aged 10. Their parents and two older sisters were almost immediately selected to die in the gas chambers. The twins were chosen by Dr. Mengele to be among his test subjects. When the Soviets liberated Auschwitz on January 27, 1945, only 200 out of 3,000 of Mengele's twins had survived. Eva and Miriam were among the lucky few. When Miriam died, Eva opened in her memory the Candles Museum in Terre Haute, Indiana. Candles stands for Children of Auschwitz Nazi Death Lab Experiment Survivors. While organizing a conference on Nazi medicine, Eva decided to contact Dr. Munch. She wanted to know more about Dr. Mengele, but Hans couldn't give her much insight. He knew him, but he had not worked alongside him. Eva had questioned him about the operation of the gas chambers, and he replied, This is the nightmare I live with. I had to watch the operation of the gas chambers, and then, when the bodies were dead, I had to sign the death certificates. Oh Munch provided God. detailed descriptions on how the pellets of colorless, odorless Cyclone B gas were dropped through the air vents into the mock showers. This was a precious testimony, one that would finally shut the trap of those few remaining morons who denied the existence of the gas chambers, or even worse, deny that the Shoah and the extermination of other undesirables ever took place. Two years later, Munch and Eva joined forces again for a special event. It was the 27th of January, 1995, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. On Eva's invitation, Dr. Munch joined for the televised commemoration, during which Eva read two documents that they had authored and signed. The first one was a declaration by Dr. Munch in which he attested the existence of the gas chambers. I saw thousands of people gassed here at Auschwitz. Children, old people, the sick, and those unable to work were sent to the gas chambers. These were innocent human beings, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, Hitler's political opponents, anyone who did not fit Hitler's idea of pure Aryan race. I am signing this paper of my own free will to help document the cruel intolerance of my fellow SS. I, a former SS physician, witnessed the dropping of Zyklon B into simulated exhaust vents from outside the gas chambers. After three to five minutes, death could be certified. This is the nightmare I continue to live with 50 years later. Eva's document was equally powerful. In her declaration, she had decided to forgive the torturer and executioners at Auschwitz, even Dr. Mengele. I, Eva Morzez Kor, in my name only, give this amnesty because it is time to go on. It is time to heal our souls. It is time to forgive, but never forget. Never forget, that was the main message carried by Hans, Eva, and others who had decided to document the darkness of the concentration camps. Individual memories are the greatest weapon against the return of such darkness. But the memory of an individual can be fickle and unreliable, especially in old age when the ravages of dementia and Alzheimer's disease can wipe clean the slate of one's memory. Yeah, Alzheimer's. Um, I've seen that hit, hit my older relatives and... It is a difficult, difficult thing to witness firsthand. And uh, anyone that deals with taking care of their loved ones uh, who are going through Alzheimer's or dealing with dementia, you're a fighter and you have my eternal respect. I know what you're going through. Ay, ay, ay. That hits close to home or distort it, changing the perception of the present and interpretation of the past. Sadly, that is what happened during the final act of Dr. Hans Munch's life. In November of 1998, he was interviewed by German magazine Der Spiegel after a viewing of Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. Dr. Munch was a household name and widely known as the good man from Auschwitz. And yet, during the interview, he made several shocking, disparaging, hateful comments about the Jewish people and he even praised Dr. Mengele's work. Bye. Mengele and the others sent us their material, heads, livers, spinal fluid, whatever came up. 
Munch claimed it was thanks to this provision of organic material that he could perform experiments in ideal conditions. He even mentioned intentionally infecting prisoners with malaria. The interview was followed by another media appearance in a French radio station. During the broadcast, Munch stated that Roma and Sinti prisoners at Auschwitz were pathetic and that the gas chambers were the right solution to get rid of them. Both his son and daughter were aghast at these comments. They revealed to the media that their father had been suffering from Alzheimer's disease for a while now. He had almost completely lost his short-term memory, and he lived in a state of mental confusion. This is the explanation on which most media outlets agreed upon. After all, his conduct at Auschwitz had been clearly documented at the first trial shortly after the war. Many witness accounts from prisoners had exonerated him from atrocities, especially infecting prisoners with deadly diseases. Munch's declarations nonetheless sparked two court proceedings in France and Germany on counts of instigating racial hatred and supporting Nazi ideology. In the case of the French trial in 2001, Hans Munch was convicted in absentia, although a medical commission recognized him as being severely psychologically disturbed. The verdict never reached him. Dr. Hans Munch, then 90 years old, had passed away in his family home in Algal, Bavaria. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you enjoyed today's video, but I do hope that the story of Hans has inspired you to study and keep alive the memory of what happened in the camps. Another Auschwitz survivor, Primo Levi, warned us that it happens, therefore it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. It can happen, and it can happen everywhere. Oh, a lot to unpack there. This was not an easy video to sit through because, again, you know, to, even going back to it, another video um, about the hero of Nanking, who, again, part of the Third Reich, but he saved 250,000 people uh, from the Empire of Japan or the uh, Imperial Army. Uh, from being assaulted and killed. Um, I guess the story of Hans Munich, or Mute Munch, sorry, Hans Munch, read that wrong, um, is a story we cannot forget because of what happened in Auschwitz. And it's important that we remember uh, just the cruelty and depravity that was done there and the stories of these survivors, because we cannot forget that. Um, you know, and, and huge shout out to Biographics for at least, you know, putting together a very detailed story about an individual that I knew nothing about. Um, but uh, it's, it's just unthinkable to really even imagine, you know, e e you know, because again, there are people who testified uh, before who saying, "Oh, if it wasn't for him, we would all be dead." Um, especially during the uh, the Nuremberg trials. Um, but then later on, I guess through old age and dementia, I'm, I guess people lose their wits. I've I've seen it firsthand happen to my loved ones. It's not an easy thing to witness. So, like with anyone in history, uh, we judge the. We judge them by their actions, the good and the bad, and everything else will be decided from then. Until then, uh, if this is the kind of content you guys like us to check out and learn more about, uh, please type it in the comment section below. Please give us your thoughts. Uh, this was a very difficult video to sit through because, again, just hearing the words, the good man of Auschwitz, just doesn't sound that comfortable to me so um but he was a person in history um and we need to know everyone's story so that we don't make the same mistakes again hopefully we don't but humanity sure likes to repeat them over and over again for some reason until then take good care of yourselves drink water and um Treat each other with kindness. Peace.